This is African American History is American History. Welcome. I'm your host, Harlan Kearsley. This program's goal is to foster understanding, promote discussion, and expand knowledge through stories of historical events, bios of unsung heroes, as well as timely and relevant news stories, which hopefully will paint a vivid picture of the effects of segregation, discrimination, and bigotry on the lives of both blacks and whites. Comparisons will be made between the many racially fractured periods of American history and what's going on right now. Ida B. Wells was one of the most outspoken women activists, black or white, in U.S. history. And this was at a time when being an outspoken black woman activist was virtually unheard of. A Memphis teacher who became a leader of the anti-lynching crusade at a time when, throughout the South, lynchings became the popular way for whites to resolve the anger and resentment they had for the newly freed blacks. From 1882 to 1968, 4,743 lynchings occurred in the United States. Of these people that were lynched, 3,446 were black. Now, these numbers may be even larger, since not all of the lynchings were ever recorded. Ida B. Wells was born into slavery in Holly Springs, Mississippi. Freed by the end of the Civil War, she lost both her parents and a sibling in the 1878 yellow fever epidemic when she was only 16 years old. She went back to work and kept the rest of the family intact with the help of her grandmother. She moved with some of her siblings to Memphis, Tennessee, where she found better pay as a teacher. Soon she co-owned a newspaper, the Memphis Free Speech and Headlight, of which, unfortunately, no copies are known to have survived. Through her paper, she reported the shocking truths about lynching, which was also carried nationwide in other black newspapers. Her life was threatened on a daily basis, and she wore a brace of pistols for protection. In 1892, when she was 23, a white mob lynched three of her friends. Wells wrote in the Memphis Free Speech and Headlight, urging blacks to leave Memphis altogether. There is therefore only one thing left to do. Save our money and leave a town which will neither protect our lives and property nor give us a fair trial in the courts, but takes us out and murders us in cold blood when accused by white persons. Wells began her investigative journalism by looking at the charges given for the murders, which officially started her anti-lynching campaign. Her article named the lynchers, pointed out that the motive was fear of competition from the Negroes, who were businessmen. Her office was destroyed, and she was unable to return to the city. She continued to speak on the issue of lynching at various black women's clubs and raised more than $5,000 to investigate and publish her results. Wells found that black people were lynched for such social control reasons as failing to pay debts, not appearing to give way to whites, competing with whites economically and being drunk in public. She found little basis for the frequent claim that black men were lynched because they had sexually abused or attacked white women. This alibi seemed to account for most of white America's collective acceptance or silence on lynching, as well as its acceptance by many in the educated African American community. Office of Anti-Lynching Bureau, 2939 Princeton Avenue, Chicago, January 1st, 1902. To the members of the Anti-Lynching Bureau, the year of 1901 with its lynching record is a thing of the past. There were 135 human beings that met death at the hands of mobs during this year. Not only is the list larger than for four years past, but the barbarism of the lawlessness is on the increase. Six human beings were burned alive between January 1st, 1901 and January 1st, 1902. 
More persons met death in this horrible manner the past 12 months than in the three years before. And in proportion as the number roasted alive increases, in the same proportion has there been an indifference manifested by the public. Time was when the country resounded with denunciation and the horror of burning a human being by so-called Christian and civilized people. The newspapers were full of it. The last time a human being was made fuel for flames, it was scarcely noticed in the papers editorially. And the chairman of your bureau finds it harder every year to get such matter printed. In other words, the need for agitation and publication of facts is greater than ever, while the avenues through which to make such publications have decreased. Nowhere does this apathetic condition prevail to a greater extent than within the membership of the Anti-Lynching Bureau. When the Bureau was first organized three years ago, it was thought that every man, woman, and child who had a drop of Negro blood in his veins and every person else who wanted to see a mob law put down would gladly contribute 25 cents per year to this end. There were upwards of 300 responses to the first appeal and less than 50% renewed it at the end of that year. The third year of the Bureau's existence is half over, and although the chairman has determined to issue a periodical, there are absolutely no funds in the treasury to pay postage, much less the printer. Nevertheless, my faith in the justice of our cause and the absolute need of this agitation leads me to again address those who have shown 25 cents worth of interest in the matter heretofore. I send with this circular a pamphlet which friends have helped to pay for. It was thought best to begin with what, to us, was the beginning of history for our race in the United States and the Reconstruction period. It was thought best to throw some light on those times and give some unwritten history. This history is written by one who can say with Julius Caesar of the history he wrote, all of which I saw and part of which I was. We can only change public sentiment and enforce laws by educating the people, giving them the facts. This you can do by first renewing your membership in the Anti-Lynching Bureau and securing others, second by paying for the copy sent you and purchasing others to distribute, third by paying for the copy of the Reconstruction Review to your congressman together with a letter urging the cutting down of the representation in Congress of the states which have nullified the Constitution. It rests with you to say whether the Anti-Lynching Bureau shall be strengthened to do its work for the future. Ida B. Wells Barnett, Chairman. This is African American History is American History. In 1895, Wells married attorney Ferdinand L. Barnett, a widower with two sons, Ferdinand and Albert. She was one of the first married American women to keep her own last name as well as taking her husband's. The couple had four more children, Charles, Herman, Ida, and Alfreda. Many, both white and black, saw Ida B. Wells as too radical mostly due to the fact that she was a woman. An early supporter of women's suffrage, Wells created quite a stir in 1913 when she refused to march in the back with the other black delegates during a demonstration by the National American Women's Suffrage Organization. However, in 1895, the 19th century's acknowledged leader for African American civil rights, Frederick Douglass, praised her work in a letter just prior to his death. Dear Miss Wells, let me give you thanks for your faithful paper on the lynch abomination now generally practiced against colored people in the South. There has been no word equal to it in convincing power. I have spoken, but my word is feeble in comparison. Brave woman, Frederick Douglass, 1895. Ida B. Wells continued her crusading activities for another 22 years, working until her death in 1931. 
In 2018, the New York Times published a belated obituary, and there is currently a push to have a street in Brooklyn, New York, where she had lived for a time, named after her. Said Brooklyn City Councilman Stephen Levin, It's important to look at our history and look at our leaders of the past who really demonstrated courage and bravery. This has been African American History's American History. The episode you've been listening to, Ida B. Wells, Brave Woman, was written and directed by Harlan Kearsley. The cast includes Soraya Butler as Ida B. Wells and Robert McKay as Frederick Douglass. I'm Harlan Kearsley, and on behalf of everyone here at African American History's American History, thank you for listening. And if you haven't done so, please subscribe. Once you do, you'll be notified as soon as new episodes are posted. Thanks again. African American History is American History. Copyright H.C. Kearsley, 2018.